some of them might remember these names, but he says these were British officers. They were Christians, but they were anti-Semites. And they didn't want to see the holy places, the Christian holy places of Jerusalem, handed over to Christ killers. This was sort of attitude among part of the British contingent there. And uh, so they are the ones who turned the Dome of the Rock into sort of a, a symbol of this new Palestinian nationalism. This would have been around 1919, 1920, the first riots in Jerusalem, like the first Intifada, the first sort of Arab pogrom against the Jews, 19, uh, Passover 1920, <laughs> importing a, a Passover blood libel, you know, and a riot, uh, you, you look at it. They are the ones who created this figure of, of Hajj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, and helped shape and birth Palestinian nationalism as a rival claim to the land and to Jerusalem to, uh, to Zionism, a rival to Zionism. It's British anti-Semites. And this Hajj Amin al-Husseini set a certain standard that any, you could not compromise one bit, any compromise, you were a traitor to the cause. And it is in the, the Palestinian national movement, whether it's Fatah or Hamas, they have always been maximalists in their demands. And anyone who says, let's, let's compromise on the right of return, gets death threats and flees. If they stay, they are goners. And it has been over a hundred years of this sort of forced um, rival claim. But it's also built on the false uh, Islamic Muslim claim to the Temple Mount, turning it into a national symbol uh, of Palestinian nationalism, but also uh, taking advantage of this, uh, this you know, the, the claim that, that the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is the third holiest site in Islam. Well, if you're Shiite, the third holiest site is, uh, is Karbala uh, um, in Iraq, or Qum, depends on where your Ayatollah came from. Uh, and for a lot of Sunnis, they don't buy into this elevation of Jerusalem and, and reverence of it. But it goes back to uh, about a century after Muhammad, about a hundred years, about three generations after he died. Um, the Umayyad dynasty in Damascus, they had converted to Islam and they were in control of Mecca, but they lost it to another tribe. And in order to create sort of a rival place of pilgrimage to Mecca, they elevated Jerusalem and said that Muhammad's night vision, that he came to Jerusalem, he came to the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It says the outermost mosque, the, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Everyone knew then that that was, this was already, it had been established for a hundred years that it's about 70 miles outside of Mecca on the way to Medina, a certain mosque which was the outermost extent of Islam at that time when Muhammad supposedly had this night vision. But if we look into, you know, that he, he, he had this vision where he, at night, a mystical journey that he rides on a winged horse, Al Barak, and goes all the way to Jerusalem. This is the Umayyads, you know, switched it to Jerusalem, to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and said this is where he came. He, uh, they actually say he tied his horse to the Western Wall. They call it the Al Barak Wall. And he tied his horse there and he went up inside the Dome of the Rock. Once you start understanding all this, uh, I'm telling you all this for a reason, because Hamas on October 7, what did they unleash? They called it the Al-Aqsa Storm. It's all about Jerusalem. Okay, when Muhammad, according to this, this later interpretation and application of this Quranic passage 
and embellishing on it and, and all, when he gets to Jerusalem, he goes into the Dome of the Rock, which is where I, uh, we say Isaac, the Bible says Isaac was offered up, where Abraham offered up Isaac, where they say it was Ishmael. And he encounters uh, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus. Here's Muhammad among, among all these biblical grades. In fact, they're all the ones tied to the different great covenants of the Bible. And they say to him, Muhammad, lead us in prayer. Why? Because of his, his spiritual revelation and standing was higher. That's what they say. This false claim to the very throne of David, where Messiah will sit and rule the earth for a thousand years, built on lies. And if you understand it, Islam teaches it is a, it is a superior revelation of God, of Allah. To, than what the Jews and Christians had. The, the, the Jews falsified the Old Testament. The Christians falsified the New Testament. Part of it was, you know, he offered Ishmael, not Isaac. They, they changed that. It, it, you know, it's a replacement of the, the people of Israel for the Arab people. They're the real chosen people. And so much of this, this view and this teaching of the supremacy of Islam over Christianity and Judaism is in this reinterpretation and application of that night vision. This is a hadith. It's not in the Quran, but it's an early tradition a uh, hundred years after that Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus said to Muhammad, you pray for us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. The Shiite people do not believe in what the Umayyads did in elevating Jerusalem as, as connected to his night vision. Why? Because the Umayyads killed Ali, the leader of their movement, and this is where the Sunni Shiite uh, schism begins over at uh, the Battle of Karbala, and they don't buy into it. Even uh, the Saudis, why do they need a rival to Mecca? They gotta, they gotta make sure everyone comes to Mecca. They don't buy this Jerusalem stuff. Even Al-Qaeda doesn't buy it this false use of the night vision and, 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 and uh, you know, it's classic revisionism and applying it to Jerusalem. They don't buy it. But Islam borrows heavily. I guess it's called cultural uh, appropriation today. They plagiarize. They borrow heavily from the Hebrew, the, uh, the Jewish, and the Christian scriptures about the end time the end of days. Okay? This is, at Jerusalem, of course, to us, it's central. It's central to what they, they believe. Okay? Uh, show the, um, the slide there. If y'all can show the slide. Let's see if it'll pop up here. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We know the dome of the, uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the silver dome mosque at the south end. It's actually an old crusader church that was turned into, or Byzantine and then crusader church that was turned into uh, a mosque. So they, you know, they took a church, turned it into a mosque. The dome of the rock, it wasn't even built when a uh, hundred years after. There was just a little... Um, so there's a couple of these little canopies, stone things where you could go and pray and get out of the hot sun up there. And they had allowed the Jews, the Umayyads allowed the Jews to go up there and pray for their lost temple. 
And before long, once you elevate Jerusalem, it turns into the Dome of the Rock, which is a shrine, the gold dome. Okay, what's this arch? All right. Judaism and Jerusalem is central to the end times. It's the throne of David. It's the place Jesus will come back to his feet. He first came lowly riding on a donkey, but then he comes back, his feet stand upon the Mount of Olives. He fights for Jerusalem, for his people, and they flee through the mountain as it cleaves. Okay, all this. And the day of judgment, judgment day, is in the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Christians and Jews agree that, that this is the, the setting for the judgment of the nations. Well, Islam says it's the, okay, we'll borrow that. But the judgment takes place at this archway. Did you know this? That they're going to hang scales from this arch just near between the alox and between the dome of the rock. You didn't even know this. This is prophetic to them. This is where the day of judgment happens. They're going to hang scales from it to weigh your hearts. There's no guarantee in Islam whether you're saved or not. You you got to be a good person. Do all the you know the pillars of Islam and tie, you know give alms and and Ramadan fasting and praying five times a day and all. Oh, it's in the in the night vision. This is this is hilarious <laughs> that somehow Muhammad. First he had he pray he had everyone praying towards Jerusalem because that's what the Jews did. But then he turned it to the direction to Mecca. But as he goes from the dome of the rock up to heaven, Allah tells him that you know one of the things you got to do to serve me and please me you got to pray 500 times a day. 500 times a day, and Muhammad said that's too much. How about five? <laughs> This is where it comes from. They pray five times a day because Muhammad talked Allah down to five when he's up there in that night vision. It's rich stuff. <laughs> if you know, it'd be funny if it wasn't so serious. Amen. So you got scales hanging there. You're not guaranteed salvation. You're. You're sitting there working it out with fear and trembling just like us. I'm assured of it, but i got to walk upright, amen, all my life. But there will be also a big sword on the top of that archway. And your heart is placed on it. It has to be light as a feather because it's going to fall on the paradise side or the punishment side. Did y'all know this? Even... Judgment Day, you see the, the importance that even, even in Iran, the Ayatollah, even though he did not buy what the Umayyads did in elevating Jerusalem and, and, and linking it to the night vision, they still believe Jerusalem is central to the end of days scenario and battle. And the false claim is such that just as there is a superior revelation of God, in the end, Islam wins. Islam wins. Now I'm a Christian. I believe there'll be a Jewish end into history, a Christian into history. Jews, for now, they believe there'll be a Jewish end of history, and that's fine. Muslims, okay, they they believe there'll be a Muslim end of history. <laughs> Let them uh, believe it. We got to get them saved and all. But they say that even Christ will come back, not Muhammad. But Christ will come back with the, the specific, unique role to wipe out Christianity, Christian belief. You know, in the book of John, uh, uh, the, uh, John's Revelation, chapter 11, where he, uh, John is told to go and measure. He's been up in heaven watching all the plagues and watching the worship in heaven. And then he's told to go down and just uh, measure or describe. Tell, tell us what's going on down at the temple and at the altar, meaning the uh, rebuilt court of the altar in Jerusalem. What's going on there? But he says, don't forget about the court of the Gentiles 
because it still trampled down of the Gentiles. I mean, this is really, uh, we can see where this is going even today. And it says something about uh, it's separated from the outer blasphemies. The outer blasphemies. Which, if you go inside the Dome of the Rock, there are verses from the Quran there, including the verse that says, God neither begat nor was he begotten. It's a denial of the divinity of Jesus. It's a blasphemy. And even John saw it in the spirit. We could talk a lot about this, but <laughs> you look and even that archway in Muslim eyes is prophetic. You understand? It's not about what happened in, in necessarily in Muhammad's night journey, even though a lot of Islam and Islamic thinking is tied to that in the way it's been twisted, but it's all about the future and who really owns that mountain and who will triumph in the end on that mountain. Hallelujah. There is a, another hadith. It, it's based in part on verse from the Quran, but it's, it's a whole, uh, a hadith is an Islamic tradition. And this is an early Islamic tradition. And most Muslims know it, and the Palestinians really know it. It says that judgment day, this judgment up here, on that archway, will not happen until the, it says there will be perpetual war between Muslims and Jews. Muhammad got upset with the Jewish tribe at Koresh in Medina because they didn't accept his revelation, his superior revelation, so he turned on them, and they become an enemy, even in the Quran, and he says there will be perpetual, the, the Hadith says there will be perpetual war between Muslims and Jews until Judgment Day, until this happens up here. And those are Hamas flags up there, okay? And Judgment Day does not come until a tribe of Muslims defeats a tribe of Jews, okay, even Arafat, uh, I, I'd have to study it out. It may go back to Haj Amin al-Husseini, who, who started this. But the Palestinians, whether you're Fatah, Arafat, or Hamas, and this hadith is expressly written out, uh, word for word, in the Hamas charter, they have identified themselves, the Palestinians, as that certain tribe of Muslims that will defeat the tribe of Jews and usher in Judgment Day. And this battle gets so intense and the Muslims are winning so much that it says that the Jews will go and hide behind rocks and trees. How many sort of know something about this? And the rocks and trees will cry out, come, there is a Jew hiding behind me come and kill him. Except there's one, one tree, I forget the name of it right now, but it's a traitor tree. It's not going to say anything, you know. And uh, I have a friend um, from Germany, uh, Johannes Gerloff, you, you, you remember him. He's a, he's a good guy. Uh, uh, reporter and theologian and, and such, but he did a book on the Palestinians and in researching and, and talking to many, many Palestinians. He would always ask them, uh, do you know what this, give the name of the tree. It was funny, most of them knew what tree it was. They know this Hadith. It has been grilled into them. It's in the Hamas charter, right? On October 7th, at the music festival, the Novik Music Festival, Raim, just two and a half miles or so from the border with Gaza, there were hundreds of Hamas militiamen came there, about 3,000 Jews and people from different countries there holding an outdoor music festival. And sure, there was a Buddha, they were dancing and 
drugs and all this sort of stuff, but I, I, I want to have grace. I don't think anyone, you know, deserves what happened to them there. 360 people slaughtered, uh, hundreds and hundreds more wounded, around 80 of them taken as hostages. It's 6.37 in the morning. They've been up all night dancing. There, A lot of them on drugs. They didn't know what was happening. It was a horrible nightmare. Thousands fleeing and hiding behind rocks and trees in ditches. Two weeks later, the first Friday after that, it happened on a Saturday morning. Two weeks later, right before Friday prayers, the Palestinian Authority, this is Fatah, their Minister of Religious Affairs, sends out his normal weekly notes to the Imams in the West Bank, in Judea and Samaria, giving them some sermon notes to preach at the Friday prayers. What does he send them? The Hadith about the rocks and trees. In their eyes, what happened on October 7th is prophetic fulfillment. And this is why Hamas says, you give us the chance and we'll do it over and over and over again. Slaughtering Jews until they're hiding behind rocks and trees. They look at this as all is with us. It's happening. This will sober you up. And it's just not Hamas. This is, this, this is the Palestinian Authority of Mahmoud Abbas. That the, that the world is saying to Israel, you, you, you got to make peace with him. And you got to let him have a Palestinian state. And he's sending out to all the imams the same hadith and this notion, we, we are that tribe of Jews, the tribe of Muslims that's going to fight the, this tribe of Jews, Israel, until judgment day. And we're going to fight them till they're hiding behind rocks and trees. This, they think, was had a, a partial fulfillment on this day. And they're not going to stop. You and I think of all the biblical prophecy that's being fulfilled and it encourages us and our heart swells and we sing and we thank God for it. Well, they, they think this was, and you know, it's, it's horrible what happened there. And yet they're rejoicing in it and saying we're going to do it again. So this is not child's play. It's not child's play. There is a rival claimant to the throne of David. God says, sit here at my side till I make your enemies your footstool. And when you start looking, even go back to Psalm 110. We'll go to Psalm 110. The chapter that, that David was talking about, as you turn there, the chapter that David was talking about, about the four horses, the, the white, the uh, red, the black, and the green horse, pale or green horse. It's Revelation chapter 6. Let me just read uh, one verse in chapter 6 before we go back to Psalm 110. It says... Uh, Verse 15, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man. This is after the four horses have been sent out. They hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Can you see where Islam probably borrowed this? A little appropriation here. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We have this notion of Jesus being so peaceful and whatever. But I tell you, Malcolm Haddon said it at the feast one year. He said, 
Jesus has every right to come and roar as a lion before, because he first came and humbled himself as a sacrificial lamb and dealt with sin. He's not coming back to deal with sin. He's coming back to conquer and to take his throne. And the Lord says, you're going to sit here until it's ready and you're going to come and I'll make <laughs> your enemies your footstool. You go back to Psalm 110 and sometimes you'll find these passages and it's not so easy to deal with, but we're not, our view of God, he's not a schizophrenic God that in the Old Testament a God of, of wrath and judgment and in the New Testament a God of love and such. He, he, he was love in both and he's a God of holiness and judgment in both the old and the new. But you read Psalm 110, read the whole passage. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Uh, you go to verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed Abraham when? When he came back from the slaughter of the kings. Okay, Abraham picked up his sword justly. And that's the moment Melchizedek blessed him in Genesis chapter 14. But here it says, the Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. This is, talk, this is a messianic passage quoted all through the New Testament. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he'll lift up the head. It's not such a nice passage, is it? It's frightful stuff. You can go all through Psalm 2, Psalm this, and, and uh, Zechariah 14, and whatever. That the things that lie ahead, it's serious. It doesn't mean that I'm calling for a crusade. We're not going to pick up the sword in the name of Christ. Uh, to, uh, to spread our faith. But it, it, we're going to pray for Israel. We're going to defend Israel. We're going to realize what God is doing and His purposes, that the world needs that kingdom of Messiah sitting in Jerusalem, ruling in righteousness and peace. And the world needs that day where they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks and neither shall they learn war anymore. There is a day, promised day coming, on the other side of these travails and this battle over Jerusalem that the world so desperately needs. But God is determined to get us all through there, and he's calling us to pray and serve as midwives as Israel uh, comes to this day, and even though all nations will come against Jerusalem, it doesn't mean every nation will be there against the Jews, but even if every nation in the world is gathered there at battle, God will accomplish his purpose, and he will set his son on his holy hill. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is a bit of a heavy message, but it's an aspect to October 7 that you, most of you probably haven't heard before. And when I first heard it uh, about a month after October 7, what the Fatah, even what they had done with their imams, it's shocking. I knew about this hadith, but then all of a sudden I realized that music festival, my goodness, and what sort of incentive it, gets, it gives them. But you and I have a precious faith in the Word of God and in God who's going to accomplish exactly what He wants. We're not, to, we don't hate Arabs, and I'm not calling for a crusade. But we need to fight in the Spirit over God's redemptive purposes because it, it, God wants to birth them into the same kingdom you and I are in already. And as with every birthing, there comes some suffering, there comes some travails, there comes some birth pains. But we're going to make it through, and God will make 
his enemies, his footstool. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you that nothing is impossible with you, that you're right on time with all your purposes, Lord. In your holiness, judge. In your righteousness, judge. In your love, judge. We know that you're perfect in all your ways and in all your judgments. And Lord, help us to be faithful as we stand on the walls interceding for Jerusalem as we stand with Israel and help her get to her promised uh, redemptive destiny in you where they are welcoming you to take up the throne of David in Jerusalem and we're just trusting you every day no matter what the headlines say and what our national leaders say you will set your king on your holy hill and you will make your enemies your footstool in Jesus name we pray amen amen